ladies and gentlemen, the Latino Endowment Fund and the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving invite, uh, welcome you to Democracy, Civic Engagement, and the Role of the Free Press, a conversation with Alberto Abardwin, President and CEO of the Knight Foundation. Please welcome to the stage, Yvette Melendez, Interim President of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. I am Yvette Melendez, Interim President of the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving. On behalf of the board, staff, and the Latino Endowment Fund at the Hartford Foundation, we are pleased to welcome you to what we expect to be a thought-provoking and timely conversation. I think you would all agree that we are living in interesting times. <laughs> I find it sometimes a challenge to keep up with the current state of affairs locally and nationally. I think it's fair to say that our country is on the edge of an unprecedented change in Washington, in the state of Connecticut, and right here in Greater Hartford. While some may view these times as dark, there is light to be found. We are seeing citizens become civically active in their communities, finding their voices and using them to engage and affect change. At the Hartford Foundation, we are committed to supporting civic engagement in our region. In 2016, we launched our campaign, My Connecticut, My Vote to call attention to the importance of voting and noting the sense of pride that people felt when they exercised their constitutional right. Members of the Latino Endowment Fund here at the foundation recognize the challenges facing our region and the need to bring the community together for conversation and invited Alberto Ibarguen President and CEO of the Knight Foundation to lead the discussion this evening. Since 2003, the Latino Endowment Fund has worked to address the needs of Latino residents and the organizations that serve them. Last year, the fund granted a $20,000 uh, grant to the Center for Children's Advocacy to support their program Project Llegar, to assist child immigrants. Again, a very timely issue in our area. Our speaker this evening has deep roots in Connecticut and in the greater Hartford region. Alberto is a graduate of Wesleyan University and returned to Hartford after law school. In fact, the foundation will take credit for this. Alberto worked for a legal aid program, the Puerto Rican Center for Justice, funded by the National Conference of Bishops, which was supported through a grant by the foundation. Alberto then became the first director of the State Elections Enforcement Commission and practiced law with both small and large firms here in the Hartford area. Beginning, before beginning his career in publishing by joining the Hartford Current. From the Current, he went on to the news, Newsday and eventually became the publisher for the Miami Herald and El Nuevo Herald. Three Pulitzer Prizes later, in 2005, Alberto was named president and CEO of the Knight Foundation. Based in Miami, the Knight Foundation believes that informed and engaged communities are essential to a healthy democracy, a belief that we hold at the Hartford Foundation. I'm sure he doesn't realize this, although I gave him a teaser earlier on, um, but I was fortunate to meet Alberto 
early in his career when I was fresh out of college working at my first job at the State Commission on Human Rights and Opportunities. What struck me then about him, besides his amazing baritone voice, <laughs> was his belief and commitment to social justice, his passion for free and fair democratic principles, and his belief in the voice of the people. I am so proud to be standing here tonight, welcoming him home and introducing him to all of you. After this evening's keynote speech, there will be a moderated Q&A session by Frances Padilla, who also has her own story about meeting Alberto. Um, Frances is the president of the Universal Healthcare Foundation of Connecticut. Ms. Padilla is a member of our Latino Endowment Fund and began her extensive career in philanthropy as a program officer with the Hartford Foundation. I think you notice there's a theme here. Everything comes back to the foundation. <laughs> Thank you, Francis, for moderating this evening. You should have received a note card when you came in. If you don't have a note card, just raise your hand and we'll get one to you. Please write down any questions that you might have for Mr. Ibarguen and the foundation staff will collect them at the end of the presentation. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Mr. Alberto Ibalguen. Thank you very much, Yvette. It is great to be back here. Um, I want to say right up front that, uh, that just yesterday, the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving appoint, uh, announced the appointment of Jay Williams, uh, their new president, and he is in the house somewhere tonight. And Jay, you ought to say hello to all of your new neighbors. As we, as we congratulate Jay and wish him, uh, wish him well, it's also a really good moment to pause and recognize the leadership of Yvette Melendez as board chair and as interim president. You really, really did it well. Thank you, Yvette. Um, and thanks to the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, the Latino Endowment Fund, uh, for the opportunity to share some thoughts on, on free speech and the value of informed and engaged communities in our democracy. This is a topic I care about deeply and a topic that for me, as you may have guessed by now, has important roots in, in Hartford. Tonight's event really is a homecoming for Susana and me. I began practicing law here, as you heard. Our son, Diego, was born in Hartford Hospital. His godfather, Bill Kosterko, is in the house. Susana graduated from Trinity College, so she was thrilled to meet President Joanne Berger Sweeney a little while ago. Our, uh, our nephew, Ted, is graduating from Trinity uh, this weekend. I joined my first professional newspaper here, the Hartford Current. I was active in community, became a foundation grantee, and it's here that I first served on the board of an arts organization and a foundation. Much of my thinking about community and about philanthropy, ideas that have animated my life and, my, and now my work at Knight Foundation took shape here in Hartford. Susanna and I spent 12 years here, which I realized by New England standards is about a season. <laughs> in Miami, where three quarters of us are from someplace else, it's almost a lifetime. Um, but back when, and I, and I remember back when I was at, uh, I was the local head of private banking at Hartford National and I met someone who, who, uh, who referred to himself as a swamp Yankee and he said, well, Alberto, how long have you lived here? And I said, a decade. And he said, well, do you think you'll like it? 
Uh, well, the answer is yes, we really did like it very, very much. Um, it's particularly gratifying to be invited to speak at an event hosted by the Latino Endowment Fund. The very fact that there exists a Latino Endowment Fund is testament to how far Hartford has traveled down the road of inclusion and engagement. In 1975, when Susanna and I first moved here, we found a city in transition, a classic New England town adjusting to a newly diverse racial and ethnic mix. I was, as, as I was the founding director of the Puerto Rican Center for Justice, uh, which was a project of the Legal Aid Society and was, was supported significantly by uh, the Hartford Foundation. I think it's not possible to overstate the importance of that endorsement, uh, the endorsement of the Community Foundation uh, for a project like ours. Being here tonight brings back many memories of those days and of the first leaders of the Puerto Rican community. I apologize to anybody I don't mention, but I have to say the names out loud of people that I do remember so with such great affection and admiration. People you may remember too. Mildred Torres, Edna Negron, Diane Alverio, Tony Soto, Eugenio Caro, whose son Freddy is my godson, Esther Jimenez, Rosaida Rosario, Yasha Scalera, Pete Rosa, I think, was in, in New Britain then, now he's here, and many, many more. Uh, just know that uh, you left a deep imprint on my mind and on my heart. My friends Frank Borges and Luis Galvin have told me about the growth of the Latino Endowment Fund. I've been impressed by the breadth and the depth of the grant making, over $200,000 focused on Latino students and parents and organizations serving the Latino community. Grant making by and for Latino community is a powerful force for good in Greater Hartford. So congratulations to the LEF Chair, Dr. Nelly rojas Swan, and the LEF Steering Committee, and thanks for sponsoring this event. For, for the past 11, <clears throat> 11 plus years, I've had the privilege of leading the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, where our mission is to promote a well-functioning democratic republic through support of free expression, citizen engagement, and equitable, inclusive, and participatory communities. Our work is not terribly well known here because we focus primarily in the cities and towns where Jack and Jim Knight published newspaper as part of what was then the largest newspaper company in America. <clears throat> Hartford was not one of those communities, but we have funded uh, two important media organizations in Connecticut. CPTV, whose strategic planning we funded jointly with the Hartford Foundation, and the Connecticut Mirror, which we helped launch. I know this is a, this is a biased audience already. Uh, we helped launch and recently supported again. Uh, we're really very proud of the work they do, bringing accurate information to the people of Connecticut, and I thank Linda Kelly and Peter Kelly, who were champions of both. And tonight, I have the privilege of announcing another contribution to Hartford, this time in the form of a matching grant of $50,000 to the Latino Endowment Fund. When, when, I was, when I was a Hartford Foundation grantee in the 70s, I guarantee you I never imagined I'd be in a position to say that. Um, or to praise the leaders who, uh, when the match is made, will have grown the Latino Fund to more than $350,000. So thank you and congratulations. <clears throat> A little bit about Knight Foundation. We, we make about $140 million in grants every year to programs, projects, and people committed to informed and engaged communities. Like Thomas Jefferson, Jack Knight knew that a well-informed community is a prerequisite to a well-functioning democracy and that you can't have either without a free press. Today, all three, informed communities, democracy, and free press are at risk. Tonight, I wanna to talk about those risks, 
but more than anything, I hope to leave you with two thoughts. There is hope and there is a role for everyone. There's a role for you. A little history. We are in a period of transition caused by technology that is fundamentally different from anything we've seen since Gutenberg, and I mean that quite literally. If you think about it, before Gutenberg, there was order. Books were few, they came with a religious authority's imprimatur, and they had distribution from the few to the few. After Gutenberg, any Tom, Dick, or Martin Luther could print whatever and distribute whatever they wanted. Information flowed from the few to the many, then from the many to the many, so many in fact, that information and opinion became hard to control. It would be a hundred years before people figured out how to trust information again. Elizabeth Eisenstein from the University of Michigan writes brilliantly about the printing press um, and, uh, and the Reformation. But trust they did eventually, and it remained that way incredibly with newspapers, pamphlets, radio, television, and even cable doing their best to inform communities right until the next truly fundamental change, the invention of internet and the World Wide Web. The web has made information potentially accessible to all for the first time in human history, and that is huge. In the age of the internet, we will be defined by our ability to effectively and reliably inform society or by our failure to make information consistently reliable. American culture, which celebrates debate and dissent, led to the enshrinement of the right to speech and press alongside religion and assembly in the First Amendment. At the beginning of our republic, the reach of media was local and largely verifiable. The circulation area of leaflets and newspapers were roughly similar to electoral districts later on. In providing the public with accessible insights into the arguments at the core of our republic, the founding fathers formalized the role of the press as the staging ground for the middle, a written and spoken battlefield where wars of words are waged until common ground is reached until common ground is reached. It is this tendency toward the middle, toward principal compromise, that I think is the ultimate genius of American democracy. Americans have ultimately always rejected extremes, offering tempering the power of an executive of one ideology by installing a legislature of another, or as I remember in my days in Connecticut, sending liberals to Congress, but more conservative representatives in the State House. Yet today, our collective ability to engage in principled compromise is waning. So how do we reverse the growing polarization and how do we inform and engage communities so that they can find, so that we can find common ground? To, to answer those questions, let's look at the changing role of the media in our democracy. To an old newspaper man, it's like telling a hammer, what do you see? A hammer sees a nail. So you'll pardon me if what I see is the solution um, and part of the problem is, uh, is media. The direct relationship between media and geographically defined communities basically held until the middle of the last century. It was the ability, the sudden ability to broadcast nationally and to offer targeted membership-based models via cable that began its breakdown. But radio and cable were nothing compared to internet. More than any other medium, internet has accelerated the decline of newspapers and television business models and altered the flow of information in ways that we're still uncovering. Internet is potentially the greatest democratizing tool in history but it is also democracy's greatest challenge in offering access to information that can support any position and confirm any bias. Social media has helped erode the common foundation of everyday fact. So what's the path? The first step is recognizing that the game has fundamentally changed and there is no turning back. There is no hand-wringing allowed. 
we can wring hands and wrap ourselves in the warm cloak of nostalgia for the good old days, or we can honestly look at where we are and consider our options. I believe the first role of media in a democracy is to present the truth, the full, accurate, contextual search for truth. And I believe in verification journalism, which means you check facts before publication. We are imperfect beings, and we will never get it exactly right, but accuracy is the goal, and in my mind, the first role of media. The second role of media in a democracy is the publication of opinion, of point of view. I would argue it's equally important, but if it gets out of balance, as I think it has today, it can have dangerous consequences. And so you might say that's lovely, but if cat memes and listicles are the business model of the present, how can you build a media future on that? The Constitution guarantees the right to speech and publish, but it doesn't guarantee the right to succeed in business. So whatever model we settle on has to meet the needs and preferences of citizens as consumers of information. And with that in mind, let me just mention three models that people are working on and that, if you wish, we can talk about uh, later in the Q&A. First, uh, and probably most right now, most importantly, uh, the social media publishers. Today, Facebook and Google are more influential as purveyors of information than the New York Times or the Hartford Current in their, in their communities ever, ever thought to be. What we know or think we know as a fact is increasingly determined by five companies out west. The accidental publishers of Silicon Valley have supplanted the power of newsrooms by repackaging their journalism, along the way mixing it with other web content branded as news, but not subject to the same standards. Ironically, the good news is that the lack of trust is bad for a social media business. If people think they, can, they, can, they cannot trust what they read on Google and Facebook, it doesn't matter that those companies didn't actually produce the content. Trust will be lost, and that's bad for business. So the forces of capitalism are leading these companies to think about authentication and truth. So I say you can count on the big five, on Google, Apple, Facebook, Microsoft, and Amazon, to weigh in on how to deliver consistently reliable information and how to use digital technology, computer programming, to do it. I'd be glad to talk more about that in the Q&A. Existing publications, number two. And this is perhaps the easiest of the three to imagine. Picture today's media outlets, only smaller and more targeted because the audience will continue to shrink. As Yogi Berra once said, if the fans don't want to come to the ballpark, nobody can stop them. <laughs> existing, existing media survive as niche or specialty publications. That's uh, very likely. But if they want to survive as mass publications, they need to figure out a digital business because that's where the readers uh, are and will be. Who's doing that best? I think the Washington Post. Jeff Bezos, who founded and runs Amazon, bought the Post in 2013 and might succeed not just because he has a lot of money, which he does, and because he's got the best editor in America, with all due respect to other, other editors in the room, Marty Barron is uh, the best editor I've ever worked with and is the editor of the Washington Post, but because they're reimagining themselves for the digital era. In effect, they, they're transforming the Post from a local paper, a, um, a company town paper, uh, to a paper of international importance. It's a strategy that fits their mission, their content, they use technology in an Amazon-like way, and like any good business, they have evolved with their audience and seized opportunity. Third, the not-for-profit model. Nonprofit publications are mission-driven and are sprouting up everywhere around the country. The Texas Tribune, launched in 2009, is perhaps the most prominent example with a business model that relies on charitable contributions 
sponsored events, and member support. Knight Foundation supports them and dozens of similar news operations, including the Connecticut Mirror here in Hartford and the New Haven Independent. Another version of not-for-profit is in Philadelphia, where Jerry Lenfest bought the Philadelphia Inquirer, created a trust to hold the asset, and then gave the trust to the local community foundation. Pretty clever. The paper continues to operate as a business, but the trust can receive tax-deductible contributions that can be applied to journalism in the paper. Public broadcasting is also not-for-profit. At first, in the 60s, public broadcasting enjoyed strong government support, significant majority support from government, a stable of corporate advertisers, and very little competition. None of those conditions apply anymore. This is the time to rethink and repurpose, the, rethink the purpose and structure of public broadcasting. And I might say that in doing so, you could do worse than reach for the mission statement of Connecticut Public Television in their new strategic plan, which is to be one of the world's bravest media organizations. As Ann Richards, the governor of Texas, used to say about politics, being in media these days is not for the faint of heart. Against this backdrop of a changing media landscape, remember that people are going to grow increasingly unhappy with the lack of authenticity on the web. As they do, they may do what they've done in other parts of the world. They may turn to government to decide, and that's un-American. You can tell me that, and you couldn't be more right. And anyone who has read George Orwell knows the dangers of doublespeak and subtle control of public agendas through alternative facts and casting doubt on dissidents and a free press. But it is a real and present danger. I, about 10 years ago, the inventor of the World Wide Web came to see us and wanted, some, wanted a, a grant to, um, to uh, battle the lack of what he called the lack of authenticity on the web. His name is Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and I thought, well, what do you want? Do you want money for 10,000 fact checkers? And he said, no, that's a newspaper solution. He said, imagine somebody being able to make this statement, uh, and truthfully, he actually did invent the World Wide Web. Um, he, he said, I didn't take out a patent on the World Wide Web because I thought it should be free and universal. And the biggest threat to a free and universal web is the lack of authenticity. I said, well, do you want, you want money for fact checkers? He said, no, that's a newspaper solution. I'm an engineer. I want to write code to figure out if something's true. I was, I can't tell you, I was, I was absolutely floored. I thought this has got to be one of the smartest people I've ever met and this is nonsense. How can you write a computer program to tell whether somebody's telling you the truth or not? Every day as I think about artificial intelligence and I think about what is happening with artificial intelligence, I realize Tim was on to something 10 years ago, and 10 years from now, we will have agents of artificial intelligence doing exactly that. If citizens are to influence the future direction of their community, play a role in its progress, find common ground with one another, and begin to lead from the middle, they need to know the facts. We need to redevelop a sense of trust in facts and in each other. Our foundation, Knight Foundation, is focused on accelerating and supporting ideas that redevelop that sense of trust in information. Over a decade ago, we began moving away from our traditional funding and initiated an exploration of the basic questions. They, they, they are so simple, it's not rocket science. The questions are that you need to answer. What device will people use? How will they use that device? and how will they value that information? And we're still at it. If you think that's overly simplistic, just think about it. When we began this 10 years ago, there was no iPhone. The first, well actually, Facebook I think was in college. The tw first tweet had not been tweeted. Um, and we're still trying to figure out 
uh, what people will use, how will they use it, and how will they value the information based on the platform. In a few weeks, we'll announce a series of grants that aim to use technology to bol bolster truth and trust. Some of the grants will fund citizen journalists. Some will fund people who will write code to check facts. Others will address the state of media literacy in our communities and develop online civic classes. Separately, Knight has, has uh, created a $27 million fund in partnership with the founders of LinkedIn and eBay to work with MIT's Media Lab and Harvard Law School to consider issues of ethics and governance of artificial intelligence because artificial intelligence is everywhere in our information future. We've also funded the Knight First Amendment Institute at Columbia University with the express purpose of supporting free expression in the digital age. The law of First Amendment as to digital has yet to be settled. We know from law cases what the law of First Amendment is for, fee for people and for press. We know what it is for broadcast. One is a right, the other is a license from government. I would rather err on the side of a right in internet, and when that moment happens, the Knight Institute at Columbia, I hope, will be there in favor of free speech. All of these efforts really do leave me optimistic. So, so do the new efforts from large social media companies and legacy media outlets. And so does your interest in the topic, as evidenced by the fact that you came to discuss it tonight. But this is not a simple message. I wish it were. I tried as much as I could. But the, I guess the, ba the base here is that it, that we do not yet, we do not yet know how to do this. Uh, if our true north is informed and engaged communities, we have to keep experimenting. We have to train scores of journalists to cover dispassionately the diversity of our nation and to keep government honest. They have to be tech, they have to be taught an entirely new technology as well as the journalistic values. We have to train media savvy students from grammar school on. How do you do that with teachers who may not be media savvy? Media organizations need to use technology to collaborate as ProPublica in New York does or as the Telegraph uh, does in Macon or as the, the uh, uh, publications from, the university, from Arizona State University uh, do in, uh, in, uh, in Tucson. This is only going to get more so. I was talking with a, a professor at MIT uh, about the revolution we're now in and how we consume information. And I asked him where he thought we were on a scale of one to 10, between one being a new technology and 10 a mature technology. And he said, without hesitation, he said two, maybe three. You ain't seen nothing yet. That means it's not too late. I choose Cornell, Cornell West one time described himself as a prisoner of hope and I, and I subscribe to that. Um, a, an optimist weighs and on balance, we might get through. A prisoner of hope knows the, the, the cards are stacked, the, the odds are stacked against you and yet I still believe that we will come out of this just like we did after Gutenberg. You may not be able to buy the Washington Post you may not be the Facebook of the uh, the CEO of Facebook, but you can contribute to the Connecticut Mirror and to CPTV to help them figure it out. That was a free plug for both of our. <laughs> <laughs> and you can be and you can be good New Englanders, embracing the town hall mentality that inspired the country from the start, the right to disagree, concurrent with the willingness to find common ground on verified fact. Thomas Jefferson sued the Hartford Current, and I might add that he lost. I always took particular pleasure in that when I was, when I was at the Hartford Current. But he still famously agreed that if it were up to him, whether we should have, quote, whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter but I should mean that every man should receive those papers and be capable of reading them. 
Commitment to democracy is not a choice you make once. It is a choice you make over and over again, and no one should feel off the hook. I close, I close, I want to close by, by expressing my sincere gratitude to you, not just for being here tonight, but for the decades of friendship and support Susanna and I have received from you, New Englanders, you know, and I know now, especially that I'm in, we live in Miami, uh, New Englanders are famously reserved people. But my Hartford was always full of open arms and open minds. Thank you. I think, Francis, we go over to the chairs. And they're actually sort of like television chairs. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Alberto. Thank you for offering some really thought-provoking ideas about the role of the free press in this democracy at this time. And um, I, so I want to start, actually, you, you teed up what you wanted to talk about some more in the Q&A. You um, identified three models of media. Uh, there's been so much change over the course of your career uh, from when you started at the Hartford Current uh, and the, the trends that you might have seen back in the 80s and 90s, how much of that has actually played out? And given the models that you identified, the, um, the uh, social media publishers, the digital media, the not-for-profit model, um, what do you see for the future for media and its role in fostering democracy and civic engagement? Look, I, I, as I said uh, a few minutes ago, I, I, think, um, I think it's an absolutely essential role um, in, a, in a democracy. The Jack Knight uh, used to talk about the role of a great newspaper was to inform and illuminate the minds of its readers so that the people may determine their true interests. It's a, it's a, it's a 100 percent Jeffersonian idea um, that an informed citizenry is what will guarantee um, the democracy. When you ask me what I might have seen back uh, in my Hartford Current days, good grief, I can tell you that I didn't see it coming any more than anybody else did. Mm -hmm. um, we thought we were on top of the world. I, I remember I was, at one point I was on the advisory committee of channel, of the CBS um, channel, I, I forget, forget whether it's channel. Channel, channel, CBS would be channel three. Channel mm -hmm. three. Yeah. Uh, was it? Uh, but in any case, and, and Dan Gold was the general manager then. and. Uh, and I was, this is before I was at The Current, I was amazed that the, that the, uh, the news meeting uh, for the TV station, the, the outline was the Hartford, that morning's Hartford Current. Hartford Current. Uh, the Current came out in the morning, they decided what they were gonna do, they needed to do a, a different take on it, and they needed motion and color and, uh, and voice and so forth, which you didn't have in, uh, in print. Um, and there was a nice complementary nature. Print is warm, um, and um, uh, and uh, and needs cool writing. Television is hot, is a hot medium. Uh, rather, television is a cool medium and needs hot personalities, as we've seen. Um, this this actually works. Um, and so it was a it was a really good combination of ways uh, to to uh, to inform community, but nothing is guaranteed to stay. And so, where I think my old business, the newspaper business, where I think we dropped the ball, was that in those years when there were newspaper companies that were making uh, twenty, twenty five, thirty percent profit. 
um, and, uh, and very little of it was going toward research and development. Very little of it mm -hmm. was going to uh, where, where, in, where the consumers were going. Mm -hmm. And the consumers were already shifting to cable. They were shifting uh, first to, uh, to uh, something called Monster, then Craigslist, mm -hmm. and that took out a huge amount of the revenue of newspapers, and we still continued to try to put the newspaper on the web. If you've ever seen a movie that is faithful to the book, I guarantee you, you saw a dull movie. Because you can't, you can't, I mean, turning the pages just isn't interesting. Right. But you tell a great movie director, here's the story, make a movie out of it, do your, do your movie thing, and that could actually work. We didn't get that. Um, and by the time I left, I really, I really felt strongly that, uh, that, that uh, my, my job at night, um, my preparation for my job at night was uh, at that point about 10 years of trying to put the, trying to make a movie about the book, trying to put the paper on the web. And I wasn't going to do that again because mm -hmm. now at night I had the freedom and the flexibility uh, to say, we're going to figure out what people will use, how will they use it, and how will they then value the information, and then work back from there to teach people the journalism skills and teach audiences uh, the sophistication they need to be savvy media uh, consumers. So what are, at, at night you have been able to experiment and um, to issue challenges uh, in journalism. What are some of the most promising um, findings and learnings that you uh, are well, encountering. We, we, as I said, we, uh, we're still trying to figure it out. Uh, I think at, at the beginning of, this, uh, of, the, of this, these 10 years, I think it was, it was not clear that, uh, that uh, mobile was, the, was king. Uh, the iPhone had not been, mm -hmm. had not been presented mm -hmm. yet. We all had, um, we might all have cell phones, and they had, te they were, they were, people were beginning to feel comfortable with text, uh, but there was nothing like a smartphone until, until iPhone comes out. So at that point, you begin to say, oh, I see. So everything was, was prelude to, uh, to this. We tried experiments, as I mentioned, with Tim Berners-Lee. It was actually something that was, um, that was uh, used and tested in 600, 700 uh, associated press, associated newspapers. Um, he got it to the point where you could identify sources, but not to the point where you could really say, this is true and that is not true. I think uh, we keep funding, we keep looking, we keep looking and now these days, we're funding a number of projects in virtual reality. Mm. As that gets cheaper, as that gets easier, that's a, that's a, a completely different way for people to, uh, to tell their stories. Say more about that. What, what does that mean, virtual well, reality? I, I think that means that I can put you in a, I can, just like you, when, when somebody went to journalism school and a professor said, do you want to put the reader in the story? Uh -huh. This literally feels like physically uh, being in the middle of a story. I saw some, a kid came by the other day and he's, I think he's, he's actually in college, but he, he came by and showed me a, um, a, comp a, a, a virtual reality based program that he had put together that tells his grandmother's story uh, about her life in Cuba. She has not been back to Cuba. She told him her stories, he recorded her, he went to Cuba, he went to the places, and she's sitting in the room telling stories about everything around her. So it's a wonderful way to tell the story, and it's a chilling way to tell the story because it was not that hard to see how you could fake this whole story, how you could fake it all. So, so being, well, for one, if I had been his grandmother, I would have been pretty awed by the whole thing and said, what are you doing? Que tu haces muchacho? Que tu haces muchacho? But there is this, this, uh, this truth, information is power, right? 
Uh, the role of the free press is to provide information so that communities can make decisions, people can make decisions, uh, hold government accountable. Um, but in this era of fake news, how do you, um, as, a, as a reader, how do you as a young person potentially um, uh, interested in a career in journalism uh, get at truth? And before you answer that, I want to open up um, and encourage everyone in the audience to write your questions and pass them to staff. If you do not have a note, pay, a note card, please raise your hand and staff will give you one because we want to hear your questions and have Alberto have an opportunity to address them. So, You know, um, the, the, the newspapers had a, a wonderful opportunity to correct every day. Um, and every day in, uh, in, in, a, in a really good newspaper, uh, you will find lots of corrections. Um, because and, and mm -hmm. anybody who tells you, no, 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 we only print exactly the truth, they're just not paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is really hard to do. to do. It's hard to do it even on a daily basis, to do it on a momentary basis. Uh, to do it as the sausage is being made before uh, a crusty old copy editor says, kid, you know, that can't be. Somebody's, somebody's blowing smoke at you and you have that process of developing a story. Mm -hmm. Go back, check your sources. You had the time. We don't have the time now. So what do we do? We either print lies or we figure out how to make the technology use us or, or, or we hope to be lucky or we use the technology um, in, in more and more sophisticated ways uh, to figure out what, what is true and, what is, and what's wheat and what's chaff. Actually, one of the most exciting things that I think we've done is this uh, partnership with Piero Midiar, who's the start, who started um, eBay, mm -hmm. um, Reed uh, Hoffman, who started uh, LinkedIn, and the Media Lab and the Berkman Center at Harvard, Harvard Law School. Everything that, I'm, that I see, everything that, uh, that I look at, and, and the obvious things are self-driving cars and, uh, and so forth, but if you talk to somebody, as I have at, at Google or at Facebook or at Yahoo or at AOL, um, uh, uh, Firefox, they, they, Mozilla, they're, they're, they are they are convinced of their of they are techno um, optimists in the extreme. They are by and large uh, not people who are doing who intend to do uh, evil. Uh, not people who intend to uh, to to tell uh, biased stories. But we all have biases. We all, that's why in newsrooms you used to have hierarchies. What, what we need to remember and what we need to check against is that this is these algorithms that supposedly deliver everything neutrally, mm -hmm. even algorithms have parents. And those parents are the programmers and the parents are giving, Bring their, own they are giving their children mm -hmm. their values. Mm -hmm. If you had typed in, and this is well known, if you had typed in to Google three years ago the word thug and looked for um, in the, you know, where you can look at images. So look at images, type in thug, look at images. What you see are pictures of really pretty ugly looking young black men, period. That's what you saw. Then it came to light that that's what you saw. And so somebody put his, probably his, not hers, his thumb, because uh, tech is so male, uh, so young and so male, uh, put his thumb on the scale, and suddenly, if you type in thug, you get still mainly, I did this the other day just to check, you still get mainly young black men, but you now get the occasional uh, really ugly Hispanic thug and the really ugly Asian thug. Women, you'll be glad to know, are apparently not thugs. Not thugs. Uh, <laughs> That's a value. That somebody somebody has made that decision. There was a moment when when America when um, United Airlines 
Uh, there was a story out, in, out of Fort Lauderdale that, that said United Airlines has um, filed for bankruptcy. The story was true. The problem was it was about four years old, but it had somehow escaped the system. Mm -hmm. This is uh, several years ago. It had escaped the system, and there, the algorithm that Google was using did not, somebody had said it in a way that did not check for the date. Well, that's a choice. In, in a newsroom, you call that an editorial decision. There's a copy editor that says, did you check the date? And I tried to, to I had that discussion with the guy who was the head of uh, Google News, and he said, nope, uh, he just would not uh, admit it. He said, our algorithm picked up the story and, del and, and moved it on. We do not put our thumb on the scale at all. We are simply a platform. And that, good news, is really changing. Mm. It really does have to change. Um, so actually, there's a question that's very relevant to this um, from the audience. Um, how do you think the best way to rebuild journalistic reputations in a world that will just search for information that confirms their personal bias? Yeah. And this is... It's a, it's, a, it, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a swim upstream. Uh, Marty Barron, whom I mentioned, uh, who was a great friend and was my editor when I, in Miami when I was uh, when I was publisher, and who's now the the publisher of the Washington Post, um, his his answer is, you do the work, you 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 let the work, uh, you let the work. Th that part of the answer is you let the work stand for itself. You you double up. You make sure that you're publishing uh, reliable and consistently reliable information. But on the business side, you think Amazon. You don't think, you're not thinking about the, uh, the story. On the business side, they have computers that will, uh, that, have, that have helped them develop the best network of stringers, I think, that any organization has ever had. The Washington Post today can give better coverage nationally, I think, than any newspaper in America. Mm. And they have computers that are looking at uh, a story that has two true headlines. Um, she wore glasses and she wore a checkered jacket, which is actually very nice, I might say. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the computer will look and see are more people clicking on glasses or more people clicking on the mm -hmm. jacket? Mm -hmm. And after a certain point, then the computer delivers just the one headline, the one that gets the most attention, and that's, it's, it's not different than if you go to Amazon and say readers who bought this book also up. looked at these others. It's a way, it's a different way of looking at the news business. It's still going after um, what the market is, is dictating. That's the business yeah, side. Exactly right. On the editorial side, get the story right. Get the story right, because there is a, responsibility in the media to get the story right. And you talk about this um, neutral uh, middle, is that what you mm -hmm. call it? Say more about what you mean by that, the neutral middle and its importance. <laughs> there's, a, there's a website called The Big Sort um, that, uh, that, and a book by the, by the, name, uh, by the same name. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the author. But the, the website is The Big Sort and it basically tracks uh, the the self division that we've done in this country of moving to more and more and more congressional districts that think and act and are like ourselves, um, and so you you see if you look at a Venn diagram of votes in the Senate of uh, 40 years ago or 30 years ago, you see red dots and blue dots and a bunch of purple dots in the middle. And the more time passes, the more you see are just red dots and blue dots. That middle isn't being fed. It isn't being fed because the, 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 the dominant, uh, uh, I think, the dominant media um, does, not feed, does not do well uh, with neutral stories. And I don't say this as a, 
as a, uh, as a criticism of television news or of cable or of internet. Um, I'm a fan of all of it, but, I, but they, they require they require hot story, they require not so much explanation um, as, uh, as hot attraction, and that doesn't do well for the middle. We are not, we are losing um, the, the everyday feeding of information, of relatively neutral information uh, to the middle, and what that does is it takes away the space where we can all agree. We've always had lots of opinion. We've always had differing opinion, religious, ideological, political, whatever. But we had lots more opportunity to find common ground when the main sources of information were basically describing the middle. Mm. And people in a community can much more easily check a newspaper than they can check Google. Um, but we, and if, if somebody comes in and starts writing, um, I don't know, about, uh, I, I don't even know if the restaurant's still going, he said that Carbone's is in the north end of town. Um, you know that person doesn't belong here. They're, they're, they're wrong. Um, but if you write that and put it on Google and I'm sitting in California, what do I know? Right. Well, so I want to shift to some of the questions from the audience. Uh, some more of the questions. So there's a question from your friends at The Current. We at The Current like to think the TV newsrooms are still using our, us as a guide. <laughs> <laughs> How do we respond to a president who does not process language as a marker of truth and facts? I'm having a tough time reading the handwriting, okay? so <laughs> That's why they type. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't the real divide between traditional media and upstart media rather than print versus online? No, I really don't think so. Um, I, I, I would hope that people are still using um, the good journalism of the current as a guide. Uh, my point is that they used to use it as the agenda, uh, not just as a guide. They were using it to decide what, what the content was going to be. But that's neither here nor there. I think the issue really is um, a, it's a different medium. Uh, I think you need to experiment. You need to, you need to figure out uh, a different way of, uh, of engaging your audience. It's why um, I think uh, we, it was why we support, for example, at uh, the, the CUNY at the City University of New York. We have a, a very active program. Uh, that tries to tra uh, turn out journalists uh, that are um, that are experienced in a range of technology, um, not only in the journalism 101, uh, but in uh, but in lots of other uh, technical aspects. Upstart, um, I, I we fund the upstarts. Um, I think the upstarts, we we literally are supporting. Uh, I don't want to say a number, of, more than 30 uh, nonprofit news organizations, none of which existed 10 years ago. Mm. Um, and, uh, and we're doing it because I think it's important that we help them experiment. If I were so smart, I would have figured out a long time ago what they should do, and I'd be home clipping coupons. <laughs> but since, I, since, I, since that's not the case, um, we, need to, we need to support them as they try to figure out um, different ways. I also think that we need to support um, organizations like The Current. We are, we, one of our major um, journalism programs is at, um, at uh, Temple University, um, basically helping, last, last first round was four newsrooms, the Miami Herald, Philadelphia Inquirer, Minnesota, um, Tribune and Dallas Morning News, um, working with teams from each of those, mm -hmm. developing best practices for utilizing digital technology uh, to tell um, journalistic stories. Sorry. This year, instead of four, we have, I think it's going to be 12. Uh, next year, we'll probably do a few more. Um, it is meant to be an ongoing program, but it is also meant to be a program that says we really value uh, the journalism you do, 
but you have got to do it in a, in a, on, a, on, on this other, you've got to do it effectively on this other platform. So we only have time probably for two more questions, yeah? <laughs> so I'm trying to prioritize, there are okay. so many great questions here. And I'd love to see them after actually. Afterward, maybe. That'll give me some good ideas for Okay, a, that'd be great. For, uh, Foundation maybe you could blog. Maybe he can blog on the Hartford Foundation's blog. Or maybe we can just do some grants. Answers right, right to now. some of these questions. Um, so, but, but I think you were talking about supporting journalism programs, and I want to bring this uh, conversation to community, to, to hear Hartford and the role of the media in Hartford in its transformation and in, in meeting its challenges. What do you have to say about that? And, and what do you say to young people in the community who want to even consider or may not even think to consider journalism as, um, as a career, especially young people of color? In fact, we first started funding CUNY uh, when their journalism school was getting organized um, because they, their target uh, was um, young journalists of color. Um, and we actually funded their, their summer intern program so that we would guarantee the income of any CUNY students, mm -hmm. uh, any CUNY journalism students, uh, precisely to, to, uh, to try to attract more, more uh, people of color. Uh, look, I, I, think, I think journalism uh, is a phenomenal business to get into. I, I take that back a phenomenal craft to get into. As a business, it, it hasn't been so good lately. And with, it, and, and with uh, school loans being such a, uh, a problem, a lot of people I, are thinking that maybe it's not a practical I, yeah, field maybe, but, you know, to, is, to go into. I've, ne I've, never, I've never been a fan of practicality, so. Uh, <laughs> we both went to Wesleyan. And that's we know. right. <laughs> and you, you of all people in this room should know. Victor Butterfield said, if the four years at Wesleyan were the best years of your life, then Wesleyan failed. Because, <laughs> because well, I'm glad purpose... to say, Mr. Butterfield, no, they were the worst years of my they, life. Because, <laughs> no, wait, because the purpose of a liberal education is to learn how to always keep on learning. Mm -hmm. That's what a journalist does. Mm -hmm. A journalist, uh, the, a journalist, a good journalist is curious. He reads, she, she, she pushes back, she questions. Uh, you have to be articulate. You have to be able to use the technology uh, to tell your stories. These are skills, I think, that are, that are useful. Whether you become a journalist or not has a lot to do with what's happening in the business. But the skills, the, the, the life skills and the, um, and the communication skills that you get in journalism, I think, are... Uh, are valid, and I would, I, I've never not felt that, uh, that, that kids who are, who, are, uh, who are able, who have a talent, who have that kind of curiosity and drive, I've, I've always encouraged them to, to go on in journalism. Okay, so this is the last question, um, and I think we're going to go to, uh, I'm trying to decide here whether to go back out to uh, the future and the technology or stay with um, community. So in researching for today, um, I came across a blog from 2007 in the Daily Costs that talked about the four essential roles of the free press. And um, of course, now I'm looking for my card here, right? So the four essential roles we're holding government leaders accountable to the people, publicizing issues that need attention, highlighting social problems to spark action, educating citizens so they can make informed decisions, and connecting people with each other in civil society. So how is the media doing in meeting these four essential goals of a free press in a free society? It depends on it depends on uh, on where you are. Um, look, I I think when you, when you look at the polarization uh, that we have um, in the country, 
Um, it's hard to say that, uh, that we've done a very good job in connecting. Uh, what, what I think we've done, and I think media has been uh, part of it, um, is we've taken um, uh, an attitude of distrust, we've taken an attitude of, of debate. As, as I mentioned in my earlier talk, I think uh, opinion uh, has, has become the dominant theme as opposed to information, as mm -hmm. opposed to uh, the, the drive is to, is to attract, not to inform. Um, but I still think it is uh, a role of media. I think it is a critical role of media uh, to hold government accountable. I think um, it's one of the reasons why I've become such a fan of the Washington Post. Um, and that's not a political statement. That's a statement that says, if we have this kind of power in, and, and this kind of media power in the political establishment, because there's really, uh, since, uh, since Obama, um, the first Obama campaign, uh, I don't think um, there's been an actual need for the president to talk to, uh, to, talk to reporters. Um, the, 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 that campaign, and certainly um, Trump's campaign, uh, have and 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 um, and now management is uh, is able to use other ways of communicating their message without forget the filter without the challenge. Mm -hmm. The issue is not filtering it through the press. The issue is facing up to the challenge. We all want to be loved. We all want to be liked. We all think we're well. I don't know that we think that we're doing good things, but let's say that we are. It still needs to be challenged, um, and and people who are powerful are pretty good at convincing themselves that whatever I thought is the right thing to do. Um, so there's a really valuable role. It isn't happening um, in uh, in in communities all across the country, and I think we tend to talk about media because it's social media and because. Uh, because of television being uh, being so national, we tend to talk about it in national terms. But where I think um, you see the the, the greatest uh, issue, I think the greatest problem, uh, is in communities in smaller communities all across the country. Mm -hmm. I was on a panel one time with John Simon, who uh, is the guy who wrote The Wire, and um, and uh, Treme. He had just he had just written the season. Of the wire that uh, that was based in the newsroom of the of the Baltimore, um, the Baltimore Sun, and uh, this is back when uh, John Kerry was in the Senate. He was chairing the committee, and he's he asked him uh, what he thought of the of the uh, the diminishing uh, number of reporters and the diminishing uh, uh, power of the press, and he he gave an answer, and then he ended up by saying, and all of these things, um, I'll tell you, you know, you could challenge, we were, we're not really sure of what the direction, but I am sure of one thing, and that is that this is a really good time to be a crook in local government. Um, and, uh, and, and Kerry, just all of us just sort of snapped back. I mean, it's the sort of thing that a writer like Right. Like Simon would be able to say, but the slap across the the, well, no, the the splash of cold water in your face um, is not that not that they are crooks. I've met hundreds of of people in politics, and I'd say you overwhelmingly these are wonderful people who want to do good, who got into it to do good. But that's not the one you're worried about. The one you're worried about, the one you're 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 checking on is. Uh, uh, is the one who goes uh, who goes overboard. I give media today uh, middling scores because we're all struggling, mm -hmm. not because we're doing mm -hmm. um, such a great job. Okay. Well, we're going to have to leave it at that all tonight. Right. Give me those cards. Thank I you see so them. much. We could easily go another hour. But
on behalf of the Latino Endowment Fund and the Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, thank you so much for coming to spend this time with us. I am personally very, very thrilled to thank have you, the Francis. opportunity. And good night Great to everyone. Here. Thank you for being here. Safe, safe drive home.